Okay, on we go with chapter 15. And as mentioned at the end of the chapter 14 notes, we have essentially completed our history of uh, psychology up to the modern era of experimental psychology uh, and research in cognitive psychology. But now we're going to, to take a step back and do a different history, this time a history of uh, abnormal psychology, which is of course a major uh, sub-area within psychology, and it has a bit of a history unto itself that is at least to some degree separate from the history of experimental psychology, although there are certainly some overlaps. The first thing we want to do is take a look at these three categories listed on this slide. Uh, supernatural, biological, and psychological, because those are what I call the three models of mental illness. And by that I mean a, a model is a theory or explanation for how something occurs or, or why some phenomenon occurs. And so throughout the course of human history, each of these three uh, levels of explanation have been proposed as to why abnormal behavior occurs. And along those lines, I think we want to start by addressing that term abnormal behavior and distinguishing it from this other term that I also tend to use called mental illness. Uh, there's an interesting paper from uh, 1960 or so by Thomas Sass who raises the issue and he notes that um, there is an important distinction between the terms. First, abnormal behavior is simply a variant on the term normal behavior and normal is uh, from the root norm which just means common and so that means that uh, normal behavior is simply defined as what most people do and therefore abnormal behavior represents some form of a deviation away from what most people do. That is very different th uh, from, than suggesting that uh, someone is sick mainly because what most people do is simply a a byproduct of their culture and the, the area and the times in which they live. So definitions of normal have uh, varied over the eons as, as human cultures have, have uh, developed. And of course they vary across cultures even within a given time period. So there is nothing about abnormal behavior that necessarily implies illness or sickness or something that is actually wrong with a person and what is, what is abnormal in one culture could be considered normal in another culture. That is not to say that there are not certain cases where someone does have something physically wrong with their nervous system that could affect their behavior and, and in that sense we might want to call it a mental illness and we will address some of these points uh, further on in the slides. First, let's consider the oldest of these models as we understand it is the supernatural model. We say this is one of the earliest explanations and that's perhaps because uh, we base some of this off of archaeological evidence so that when we look at um, uh, ancient uh, human burial sites we find artifacts buried uh, with the skeletons that suggest uh, uh, various religious rituals uh, that um, may have had something to do with illness. And on top of that, supernatural explanations have persisted, not just, they were not just unique to prehistoric humans, but were also uh, around all throughout the, uh, up through the Middle Ages, and even a little bit beyond in some cases. So the definition of a supernatural explanation uh, is somewhat varied. It, of course, can depend on the specific religious beliefs of the culture that is proposing these explanations, but in general we might suggest that it is seen, and it's not just perhaps what we might label again mental illness, but, but again even a physical illness could be seen as some sort of a divine retribution. If an individual has offended the gods, uh, then an illness, whether it is mental or physical, could be seen as divine retribution for offending the gods. Sometimes it might be seen as uh, possession, being possessed by some evil demon that alters your behavior in some way. And one thing that we're going to see with these various models, these three models is of, of mental illness, is that um, if we, when it comes to suggesting a treatment for uh, the behavior, the treatment obviously is derived from the proposed explanation. So if we have supernatural explanations of mental illness, we're going to have supernatural treatment. So this means doing some sort of a ritual, prayer, or voodoo that would attempt to appease the gods and, and satisfy whatever uh, sin had been committed. Uh, if in the case of 
possession, we have obviously exorcism, which is designed specifically to remove uh, such, a, such a demon. Uh, and then there's also the curious practice of trepanation, which is something that has been practiced for eons. And so again, this is something that began, you know, observations in uh, archaeological evidence showing that some skulls had uh, holes that in them, inflicted in them, that were obviously not something due to, uh, for example, uh, falling from a high place and landing and hitting your head on a rock or getting your hit, hit on the head with a club or anything like that in, in the case of being in a fight or battle or something, but rather it's appear that these were inflicted with primitive surgical instruments, uh, cutting specific, you know, square shaped uh, he sur uh, holes into the skull. And what could possibly be the purpose of, of such a treatment? And one proposed explanation, and again, this borrows from uh, looking at surrounding evidence in terms of other artifacts uh, found on such sites, is that the belief here is that uh, uh, an afflicted person could have uh, some evil demon inhabiting their body, and so by opening a hole in the skull, this now allows for a pathway to, for this demon to escape. And it's interesting that they choose the head because it shows, uh, even for a primitive level of explanation here, it shows that they were associating behavior with the head. And that hasn't always been the case throughout human history to suggest that the brain is the basis of behavior. Famously, uh, other organs like the heart and the liver and the pancreas have all been proposed sites of certain kinds of cognitive processes uh, throughout, uh, the, throughout the ages. The next development in terms of understanding behavior and mental illness is the biological level of explanation. And it began more or less with uh, the beginnings of, of uh, medicine as we understand it, which came from the Greeks. Hippocrates was one of the earliest of the, uh, what we label as a physician. Even modern physicians now take what is called the Hippocratic Oath as part of uh, receiving their, their uh, license to, to practice medicine. And Hippocrates' uh, explanation for illness, and again, this is not just mental illness, but any illness, is called the humoral theory because it's based off of the four bodily humors. Humors are basically fluids in the body, and he labeled that there are four primary humors in the body. And they're listed down on the next point below Galen. There, are, there is green bile, red bile, or blood, yellow bile, and black bile. And for Hippocrates, you're supposed to have a sense of balance between these four humors. And any time there is an imbalance amongst the humors, this results in illness. So again, treatment must match the cure, or sorry, treatment must match the cause. So therefore, you need to restore balance in some way. And, and the treatment, in this case, is bloodletting. The argument goes is that uh, opening a vein, because as, as, as Hippocrates and others thought, the veins contain not just blood or red bile, but they would contain all of the biles. And opening a vein would cause whichever particular humor that was in overabundance to flow more, flu more, uh, more, more uh, strongly out of that uh, cut. So uh, that would somehow restore balance. That was the theory. Uh, a bit later, Galen extended Hippocrates' humoral theory to suggest that slight uh, personal uh, individual variations in uh, the, the humors uh, account for different personality types. So this is moving the humoral theory into the realm of, of psychology, of personality psychology, or what we call the four temperaments. So there's the phlegmatic personality associated with an excess of green bile, which generally results in individuals who are a little bit sluggish and have what we call a flat affect, which means they're unemotional un and typically not very responsive emotionally. Uh, the sanguine personality uh, associated with an excess of red bile or blood is, is a cheerful personality. The choleric personality associated with yellow bile is the ill-tempered, irritable uh, person that we might even nowadays uh, label as that infamous type A personality. And the melancholic uh, personality type associated with black bile is associated with someone who is sad. And likewise, even though these all are associated with um, normal variations between individuals, there could also still be an imbalance so that maybe an excess of, uh, an, an over excess of black bile could lead to what we label as depression. Uh, an over excess of red bile could, could create what we call mania. So any of these kinds of now mental illnesses or abnormal behaviors are again caused by 
imbalances between the humors and again the treatment is bloodletting. Now of course this is a early and primitive level of explanation that is no longer accepted, although somewhat ironically bloodletting even beyond the humoral theory, bloodletting persisted uh, for centuries and was practiced well into the 19th century. Uh, but, but we also now have modern medicine, which again falls under the category of a biological cause. Because if we, treat, if we are treating, um, mental illness is something caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters, for like uh, roles of serotonin or dopamine or anything like that, in mood disorders, or hormonal imbalances, or genetic factors for, for schizophrenia, or anything like that, then obviously those are biological levels of explanation. And again, the treatment matches the cause. In this case, some form of medication, such as something like an antidepressant that alters neurotransmitter levels, hormone replacement therapy, and anything else along those lines. And then the most recent level of explanation is uh, the level of psychological model. And being in the most recent doesn't make it the most advanced or the most correct. It is just a uh, a newer idea that uh, arose mainly uh, until not until uh, the British empiricist movement, and hence I mentioned John Locke and and, uh, and uh, of course also John Watson here, because if you remember Locke and the empiricists, what they argued is that we're born as a blank slate. So in that particular from that particular perspective, all of our behaviors and everything about us uh, is something that is learned through experience. So the emphasis here is placed on early experiences or any experiences. So the idea, especially from a behaviorist view, like what Watson would suggest, who was also, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the epitome of British empiricism, uh, everything is learned. So, you know, fear uh, as, a, as a response and having phobias as response to stimuli that might be considered abnormal. As Watson demonstrated with little Albert, it's just a byproduct of previous conditioning that he conditioned fear of a, of a, of a uh, rat in little Albert. Freud also has similar statements to make about the effect of early experiences and learning, and we'll, we'll get into Freud more in chapter 17, but again, there are early things that happen to us that could cause frustrations and fixations and conflicts and repressions and so forth, and so there are all these kinds of traumatic experiences, and so all of these learned associations. So in, in this particular case, abnormal behavior is really seen as an abnormal response to a stimulus from the behaviorist perspective. So again, the treatment must match the cause. So if, if it's just an improper stimulus response relationship, an SR chain relationship in which the response is an undesired abnormal response, uh, the treatment would be to obviously change the way someone responds, to retrain them, to weaken one the original association between the stimulus and the response and uh, teach a new stimulus response relationship with a desirable one. And so this is called behavioral therapy or more, more modernly cognitive behavioral therapy because the focus is also on changing thought patterns as well as changing response patterns. Uh, so a classic example of this is what is called systematic desensitization, which you may have heard of before. And it's a very useful uh, treatment for uh, treating phobias, for example. In the case of phobias, uh, the idea behind a stimulus response level of explanation is that let's say you have uh, arachnophobia, a fear of spiders. So you see a spider, that's the stimulus, and the response is to have a bunch of symptoms somewhat equivalent to a panic attack, increased blood pressure and respiration and heart rate and feelings of panic and so forth. So obviously that's the considered to be the abnormal response to the stimulus, and so we want to train the subject to produce a different response, a response that is more relaxed and calm. So first thing you do is you teach them how to engage in relaxation techniques. You teach the, the person how to uh, pay attention to their physiological responses and, and, and relax their muscles and, and slow down their heart rate and slow down their respiration and calm themselves down. So you give them these tools and techniques first and foremost, and then you begin by exposing them to sti the stimulus. But you don't start by throwing a tarantula in their lap. That's actually called flooding, and that's a different technique that is highly controversial, but, but rather you start with a, a mild version of the stimulus, such as just a simple pencil sketch of a spider. And they might feel a very mild level of, of arousal and anxiety in response to that, but they will be able to then practice their relaxation techniques so that they train themselves to respond with calmness and relaxation in response to that stimulus. And once they have mastered that level, you gradually increase the level of threat of the stimulus so that you go to more, more and more realistic drawing or depiction of the spider to perhaps a 
toy spider or a videotape of a spider to actually having them uh, work themselves up very gradually to the point of being able to be around a real spider to have a real spider even crawl on their hand and still not be not uh, have a panic response but to be able to produce the relaxation response and once they've gotten through all of these steps then the idea is that the entire stimulus response chain has been has been re relearned. Now getting to this point gets us up to a, a modern debate and I want to emphasize right off the bat that this slide is what I call a false dichotomy that is to say I am calling it psychology versus psychiatry as if these are two competing points of view that are in, irreconcilable and let's know right off the bat that that's not true. But I want to make that uh, distinction just for the sake of debate so that we can get ourselves to the point of understanding why they are in fact uh, reconcilable positions. Let's take a look at what the, the psychiatrist is all about. The psychiatrist is a person who goes to medical school, not a degree, in, a PhD in clinical psychology, but they get an MD. And likewise, they have the ability to prescribe medication. So we could take a simplistic view and associate the psychi psychiatric model with the biological model of treating neurotransmitters with, with anti-anxiety drugs, and antidepressant drugs, and so forth. And the psychologist is someone, a clinical psychologist, who goes to graduate school in clinical psychology and gets a PhD, or now a PsyD is another possibility. And they do not pres prescribe medication. They engage in talk therapy and various cognitive behavioral therapies and other sorts of therapies um, with their patients. So they are obviously someone who would take the more psychological model. We can make extended comparisons here to our old mind-body debate, right? Because now, again, the biological model, if it's saying that behavior is caused by uh, something biological, something going wrong in the brain, some structural or physical defect in the brain, then we're talking about the behavior as being essentially equated with the physical brain. And so in terms of the mind-body issue, this is uh, materialism. It's monist materialism. For a psychologist, they, what they are treating is if the therapy is affecting behaviors, changing thinking patterns, and we're not concerned with the body, then that's more uh, relatable to dualism because we're treating behavior as sort of something that happens regardless of what's happening in the brain. Now again, that's a, a false dichotomy. Why? Because psychiatrists also practice talk therapy in addition to prescribing medications. They don't just give their patients pills and send them home, but they engage in therapy. Clinical psychologists often work in conjunction with physicians who prescribe medications so that the physician might be supervising a patient's medication levels and how they're responding to the medication, but the clinical psychologist is the one who regularly uh, inter inter interacts with them and, and engages in therapeutic sessions with them so that clinical psychologists also are recognizing the importance of using uh, medications when necessary. So we're making that distinction, but let's just you know, re recognize that it's, it's an exaggeration of sorts. But there's another level of this debate that I want to address, and it relates to the issue of public perceptions of abnormal behavior and mental illness. And it's what we call the disease model versus saying it's just in your head. And, and each of one of these are things that I have heard people who are not educated in psychology express about uh, behavior and mental illness. If we take alcoholism as an example, at one point in time, uh, being an alcoholic was something that was stigmatized because it was seen as basically a moral failing, that someone had failed to control their behavior. It used to be said that just they just can't hold their liquor, so to speak, right? And so it, it was really just a social stigma and a moral failing to have become an alcoholic. But then uh, comes the medical level of explanation where people start finding, researchers start finding that uh, alcoholism tends to run in family, they identify genes that are important for alcoholism, and we start saying that alcoholism is in fact a disease. Now doing that has some positive implications because now when we call it a disease, it ceases to be a moral failing. We don't blame people for having cancer, we don't blame people for having uh, heart disease, and we don't blame people then for having alcoholism if it's seen as a disease because diseases are things that people get that are often seen as being beyond their control and it's no longer a moral failing it is just a disease and so now it's easier to be more sympathetic uh, 
uh, for individuals and it's not just for alcoholism but we can label it for depression or anxiety or schizophrenia that these are diseases that people contract not not as if they're communicable but they are acquired somehow and um, and so now these are not moral failings but on the other hand if we understand that not everything is really uh, a disease per se as we mentioned earlier there's this distinction between abnormal behavior and mental illness and not everything is associated with some something going wrong in the brain and when we make that distinction we have to worry about the alternative uh, public perception which is that oh are you saying that if it's not a disease that there's nothing going wrong physically with this person that it's really just something inside their head and if that's the case they could just choose to stop doing what they're doing at any point in time and while it might be the case that it is quote unquote in their head it's not as simple in, in, in most cases to just say oh, I'm going to just flip a switch and say I'm going to stop doing this if you're depressed and there's not anything physically wrong with you necessarily in some cases maybe there is but in some cases maybe not but if you are depressed it's not as if you could just flip a switch and say oh, I'm going to stop being depressed now Ironically, I have heard clinical psychologists state that it is possible for people to do that, but I don't think that that, that is very likely. Um, and what we all should know, being advanced psychology majors at this point, is that if it is a purely psychological problem, then if, even if we look at the behaviorist level of explanation of, of having years and years of conditioning experiences that have conditioned us and trained us to respond in particular ways and that's why we behave the way we do it really is not that simple to just flip a switch and say I'm not going to do that anymore it takes a lot of intensive therapy to change that behavior and to change those patterns of thinking uh, so but we have to keep this in mind when speaking about these concepts to uh, people who are not educated in psychology and who do not understand the significance of, of previous conditioning and a lifetime of conditioning and the difference between diseases and psychological problems. Now the example of alcoholism is a useful one because it also helps us understand how these two models can be reconciled. A medical model of, of it might suggest that there's a gene that causes you to become an alcoholic. A psychological model would say no, it's rather that you have grown up around alcoholics and therefore you have observed other people drinking to excess, you have observed other people using alcohol as a way of dealing with stress and anxiety and other life problems, and so you imitate that behavior. You have been conditioned and trained to engage in that behavior. It also reminds us of a nature-nurture debate because a genetic basis would say, oh yeah, you're born with it. Psychological learning level says no, it's something that you acquire through experience. So it reminds us of the rationalist empiricist debate and so on and so forth. But as we really understand things, whenever we know that the nature-nurture debate comes into play, we already know that the answer is both. And so the answer is also both for alcoholism. There might be a genetic basis for it, but having a particular gene does not curse you to becoming an alcoholic, but rather having the particular combination of that gene, which will causes what we call a genetic predisposition towards addiction or alcoholism, that gene, having that gene combined with the right kind of psychological learning experiences in life could increase your risk factor dramatically for becoming an alcoholic, but the gene combined with a different environment might have a, a much decreased risk factor for alcoholism. Likewise, someone without that gene could still become an alcoholic if they were in the right environment. So the, all that the genes really do is they uh, interact with the environment to raise and lower your risk factors. The last thing I want to talk about when it comes to how we treat those who we tr uh, who consider mentally ill or abnormal, uh, again we talked about treatments in terms of bloodletting and, and supernatural treatments and so forth, but there's a general uh, trend here that I also want to come bring up with which is the issue of therapy and the use of insane asylums which began in the dark ages and persisted through the middle ages. And these insane asylums were not what we think of in nowadays as mental hospitals at all, but rather were essentially dungeons and prisons. And the treatments were cruel and inhumane, involved dousing people in ice water baths to kind of shock them, to wake them up and make them stop doing what they were doing, uh, putting them in a spinning chair, which is a chair that was suspended on a tight rope and then uh, turned around uh, many, many times and then let go so that the person would spin around r rapidly for several minutes. And that thought was that was thought to improve their circulation, but it was really obviously just a, an unpleasant experience. And um, 
And of course, they were often just chained up and beaten and everything else. And part of it was uh, purely just experimental. We don't really have any idea what's wrong with you and what's causing this, so we're just going to try these things out. And other uh, aspects of it was because people were afraid of of these other of these individuals who were suffering these problems. They were afraid. They didn't know what was wrong with them and why they were acting that way. It was it was disturbing and mysterious and sometimes there was a lot of fear because some supernatural levels of explanation were still common and so they were afraid that that person was a demon and they didn't want to be around that person so they would just lock them up in a dungeon to to keep them away from society all of these kinds of explanations persisted well up until the 1700s when we get um, Pinel, who was amongst the first here, and he was at two hospitals that I won't attempt to pronounce but these were both insane asylums and he there he pioneered uh, the uh, the approach of openness of sort of not treating them as prisoners but actually talking to them and being nice to them and letting people sort of have some time outside to walk around in a courtyard and even though he was he met with a lot of opposition early on by people saying you know you can't unchain these people they're going to kill you if you do that it turns out that he was quite successful and so gradually his approach caught on a little bit later in the United States Benjamin Rush who was a uh, physician in, in Philadelphia in the, in the Northeast uh, during the time of the American Revolution, uh, also treated people uh, in asylums, and so he was kind of seen as a psychiatrist as well, but he did other things. He was a general surgeon. Um, but because of you know the, uh, the era of the times in terms of uh, the, you know, the American Revolution and concepts like freedom and liberty and so forth, that he, he kind of treated that as saying, you know, giving people liberty and giving them their freedom is a way of treating them. And, and uh, so he kind of uh, echoed what Pinel was doing. And then also um, the last remnants of these kinds of asylum approaches were uh, uh, assaulted by Dorothea Dix, who was more active in the mid to late 1800s uh, as she campaigned to eliminate any remaining uh, insane asylums and treating them, treating uh, these patients as prisoners in any respect. Culminating in 1896 at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Professor Leitner Whitmer created what we nowadays consider the very first psychological clinic, which was a place that people could just go and talk to a psychologist and receive therapy. And, and you know, kind of therapy that we, not obviously therapy has changed in the last 100 plus years since 1896, but the kind of therapy he was doing was far more consistent with modern approaches than uh, more older therapies. One specific therapy that we want to talk about is hypnosis. And I want to trace the, uh, the development of this, in particular because it's going to help us understand Freud a little bit here. Hypnosis began not as what we call hypnosis, but as something called mesmerism because of uh, Franz Anton's mesmer who uh, believed that the underlying causes of, of abnormal behavior and illness were because the body's magnetic fields were out of whack. And as a way of treating this, we want to somehow restore the proper polarity in your magnetic fields. And so his treatment would involve waving magnets over you to get those magnetic fields back where they're supposed to be. Now, ultimately, he began to believe because, of course, he felt that we possessed, our bodies possess magnetic fields. This is called animal magnetism. And ultimately, he, uh, because uh, he, as he, uh, was, he was a very charismatic figure, and as he began to uh, progress with these therapies and have some success, apparently, in treating his patients, that he began to feel that he himself became a powerful animal magnet, and he no longer needed to actually use real magnets, that rather he was able to just use his hands, that place his hands directly on people and uh, wave his hands over them and basically do all of this mystical kind of stuff, not to mention combined with a little bit of wine and a little bit of spooky music. And putting all that together, we end up with uh, people sort of going into a trance-like state. And after being in this trance-like state for a while, they have an emotional breakdown and they kind of get over it and then they f report feeling a whole lot better. And Mesmer started to develop quite a bit of a following and make a lot of money, and he was training other people by being able to, claiming to pass his magnetism on to those, uh, his apprentices. And so this began to spread a little bit, and it worried the French government. And at the time, Benjamin Franklin was the U.S. ambassador to France, and he was seen as a respected scientist. So he was uh, commissioned, along with a group of other French scientists, to uh, 
investigate Mesmer's claims and to figure out if there was any validity to what he was doing. So what they came up with was an idea of setting up a fake mesmerist shop. They had a person who says, okay, in reality, I don't have any magnetic powers or mesmerist powers, but I'm going to claim that I do, and people are going to come in to see me, and I'm going to tell them that I'm a mesmerist, and I'm going to engage in all of the same techniques and treatments that Mesmer and his apprentices use. And so they did that, and this, this fake mesmerist shop was able to achieve the same level of success in terms of making people feel better than that Mesmer did. So that in and of itself was the sufficient uh, uh, tool and, and uh, finding to show that what was happening with Mesmer was, had nothing to do with magnetism but everything to do with the power of suggestion that just by getting people into these trances and convincing them that this what was happening was actually going to work that they in fact felt better it's, a, it's associated with what we now think of as a placebo effect that if you expect the treatment to work it very well just might work but the interest in the ability to get people into these trances interested other doctors and so there's Abby Faria but also Charcot and Charcot refined the technique to get people entranced and what he found is that some people could be uh, hypnotized and other people could not and his argument is that the presence of hysteria is the defining characteristic here so the idea here is that if you are hypnotizable is because you possess a mental disease called hysteria and this is a, a special kind of a disease that that weakens your your uh, powers to um, uh, uh, to be uh, put into these states of suggestibility by the doctor and so you it makes you easier to be uh, makes you more suggestible um, and then What's also interesting is that two important other psychologists, Pierre Genet and Sigmund Freud, studied under Charcot. And Freud is trying to understand this concept of hysteria. And what he comes up with is the idea that hysteria is a special kind of disorder that resides in the subconscious mind, or the unconscious mind technically is what Freud called it. And so the idea is that what hypnosis does is that it allows you to access the unconscious mind of the patient. And if you have, some kind of a problem residing in that part of your mind it's in there wanting to get out but you your conscious mind can't directly access it so the process of hypnosis is a way of stripping away the conscious mind and giving him direct access to the unconscious mind where the problem resides so that's why people with these kinds of disorders are hypnotizable because that part of the unconscious mind is actually wanting to get out if you have no such problems then you won't be hypnotizable because there's really nothing that nothing dramatic going on in the unconscious mind so Freud used this and when we get to chapter 17 and talk about Freud we're going to see that you know he felt that that's where the all of these psychological problems arose from so he used a variety of different techniques to try and access the unconscious mind not just hypnosis but also free association and dream analysis and so on all of which he thought were reflecting what was happening behind the scenes in someone's unconscious mind